You walk into a store with a few items on your shopping list and somehow leave with a cart full of stuff. This doesn't happen by accident. I don't think addicted, but if I had a bigger allowance to shop there, probably. <laughs> Ever wonder why Costco places staples like milk and eggs in the very back of its giant warehouse stores? I have spoken to people that go and drop in into a Costco three, four times a week. It is a very frictionless experience. Or why Trader Joe's keeps discontinuing exciting new products? The thing that's preposterous, right, is it's, it's the anti-grocery store or why Swedish meatballs are such an integral part of the IKEA shopping experience. By having the scent of baking, of warmth, of sugar in particular, that takes the stress out, they get down the stress of payment. These are just a few ways brands keep shoppers emotionally engaged and how they get us hooked. Now I am an executive member at the Costco. Very berry with extra berries. We came for pumpkin pie, actually. And the king crab legs. I think some of their customer base is absolutely addicted to Costco. Welcome to Costco, where everything is huge. And it's been like this for 30 years years. From the carts, to the warehouses, to the products themselves, it's a store fit for giants. It's designed as much for a forklift truck as it is for people. That sense of scale is part of what the Costco experience and the warehouse experience is all about. And Costco has made billions in revenue from its no-frills model. Nothing in a store is placed by accident. Take, for instance, staples like milk and eggs. You have to travel all this way just to find the dairy. This leads to something Costco calls treasure hunting. The more you see, the more you discover, the more you end up putting in your cart. You wind up buying other things you probably don't really need. You almost have to go in with blinders on and walk right past the things that you are tempted to buy. But buying in bulk isn't for everyone. For me personally, it would be a waste of money to get a Costco membership because it's, I can't use up 25 pounds of flour or, you know, some of the really big bulk items. It just isn't worth it for me. The average Costco transaction is between $130 and $140, but members have been known to spend much more. I thought I would spend about $25, and I ended up spending over $700. $187.65. $221 in change. You can come in here and spend about $250, $300, easy. They have a very loyal membership base. 90% of their members renew their membership. Being a wholesale club member comes at a price. The interesting thing about Costco is that when you speak to a consumer, they go quite frequently. I have spoken to people that go and drop in into a Costco three, four times a week. It is a very frictionless experience. Moving through a Costco is pretty seamless. There's minimal signage, the aisles are super wide, and the carts glide on the concrete floors. There are free samples and even the occasional massage demonstration. You're free, nay, encouraged to wander and take your time. I have so many memories of like being a kid with my sister, like running around the store playing tag or like hide and seek because it's so easy to hide in there. Now we have a hiding place. Hello. Hello. So my parents would leave me on the couch there and I'd like go through all the books. They'd come back to pick me up when it's time to leave. The longer I can hold you in the store, the more likely I'm going to get more money out of your pocket. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of the Costco food court. And the food court. Food court. I only went to Costco with my parents just to go to the food court. That front snack bar is both a snack bar, but it is also a parking lot. And it's a parking lot for your two-legged pets called often children and husbands. This right, is my favorite type of sample. What is it? Like the big ones? Yeah. The big ones, right? There's a direct correlation between people who sample and the amount of money you spend. 
Aside from their famous $1.50 hot dog combo, Costco is well known for its in-house brand, Kirkland Signature. Kirkland paper goods, bottled water, and olive oil are some of their most beloved products. But Costco isn't all bulk toilet paper and coffee beans. It also carries luxury items like this engagement ring that costs nearly $28,000. At first, it seems asinine. Why on earth would Costco be selling diamonds? If you dig a little deeper, it actually makes sense. Costco's also built its franchise with an older American affluent consumer. It is the baby boomer generation that has the money in their pockets and the incentive to save. That baby boomer generation controls the overwhelming majority of wealth in North America. And you know what? They're going to be around for a while longer. Costco isn't just a store, it's an ecosystem. My mom's a master of Costco. She even bought curtains there. And she gets gas there. She's embedded in the whole Costco ecosystem. The most loyal consumers have been dedicating more and more share of wallet towards Costco. So they might have started with household goods, and then they went into groceries, then they started buying appliances. Before they know, they were getting all of their furniture from Costco. And now you see a lot of people also participating in their car and hotel programs, for instance. If I think about why people keep coming back to Costco, there are three things that are part of who they are as a brand that is very well known, which is value, quality, and consistency. At Costco, you save money. Members love Costco for their cheap, high-quality products, like peanut butter. For New Yorkers, it's clearly a better deal to shop at Costco. And let's not forget about the wine. My favorite part of the Costco experience is probably their wine section, which I know sounds a little weird. Costco, it does obviously have some really great, beautiful, expensive wines, <laughs> but it also gives you a lot of value-friendly wines, which are really, really nice. Costco is the largest seller of fine wine and expensive spirits in North America. They make their money getting you to buy 200 garbage bags all at the same time. They make money getting you to buy 10 pounds of coffee rather than two. But stocking all those garbage bags isn't free. So how is Costco making a profit selling wholesale goods? Costco runs about 4,000 items on average per warehouse, which allows them to be extremely efficient. Employees don't waste time restocking shelves because of the store's design. The other upside of having such a curated assortment of fast-selling items shows up in their balance sheet. They're able, typically, to sell their inventory before they actually have to pay it, which keeps the needs for working capital pretty low. They have direct relationships with all of their suppliers and then have a logistics set up where they, the goods are delivered directly to their warehouse. So that keeps the SG&A at a very minimum level. Costco plays by the golden rule. You treat your suppliers and employees well, they treat the customer well, and you make tons of money. That's the Costco secret. So how does this model hold up in the age of Amazon? The surgence of Amazon has not hurt Costco's business, and there are many consumer tests or retail tests out there that compare if you buy in bulk at Amazon versus buying in bulk at Costco, where do you get the best deal? 70 to 80% of the time, you're still getting the best deal at Costco. Almost all major big box merchants have some form of online presence. Having some form of physical place for us to be able to do our drive-by and pick something up is going to be part of our consuming future for at least the next 50 years. It seems Costco nailed the formula when it opened 30 years ago, but it isn't perfect. Costco has been traditionally a leader in looking at how to improve the sustainability of their supply chains. They actually have done a great job at leading the way towards sustainable seafood, and I know we're working currently on uh, sustainable beef, uh, among other things. One of the things that they could be doing to improve their performance is r respond to one of the most pressing issues of the moment, which is how to reduce our plastic use and plastic waste globally. So anything they could do to, to uh, improve their packaging or improve their, 
their alternative offerings to help customers eliminate the use of single-use plastics would be great. Despite the criticism, Costco members remain loyal for one simple reason. Everyone loves a good deal. Are you a Costco shopper? Do you think it's worth it? today, of course, we're going to shop around. Ikea? It's Ikea. It's Ikea. Ikea store. I, I love Ikea. I've been shopping online this morning. I buy a lot of things from Ikea. Yesterday. I love the princess cake. While I was in Miami on vacation last week. The Malm collection, of course. And these at Ikea are $5.99. It was such a great price, I actually grabbed a second one. The best a cabinet. I don't think addicted, but if I had a bigger allowance to shop there, probably. <laughs> Welcome to IKEA, the only place in the world where you can snack on Swedish meatballs while you shop for your new poing chair or farjik mug. IKEA has 433 stores in 53 countries. 367 of them are owned and operated by Inca Group. Despite serious product recalls and food court scandals, IKEA is going strong. There's something about the uniqueness with the yellow and blue and the meatballs and the long way through the stores and maybe the twinkle in the eye as well. That makes us just a little bit more human than others, but that's a speculation. <laughs> IKEA's combined global and online presence is massive. It brought in $45 billion in retail sales, had 1 billion store visits, and 2.8 billion online visits in 2019. Its closest competitor in the home furnishing space, Bed Bath & Beyond, brought in $12 billion in 2018 in in-store sales. Before the massive blue and yellow warehouses, there was a young Swedish man with a simple idea. Why are beautiful products only made for a few buyers? It must be possible to offer good design and function at low prices. IKEA was founded in 1943 by 17-year-old Ingvar Kamprad at Umtrud Farm in Agunrud village in Sweden. It started small, selling things like pencils and postcards. In 1948, IKEA started selling furniture. In 2019, it sold 7 million Billy bookcases. A major reason people flock to IKEA is its price point. When I hear IKEA, I think of cheap, simple furniture that like, looks really nice. IKEA falls in the affordable area of the spectrum, but it depends on what you buy. They have beds that start at $99. They have really well-designed beds that go up to $500. The IKEA brand is sleek, minimal, and affordable. IKEA, from its very beginning, has focused a lot on its customers building its own furniture, and therefore they could offer them cheaper prices. If you're starting out, you're moving into your first apartment, you don't have a lot of money to spend, keep it simple, look at Nordic design, buy some simple IKEA pieces, and invest in some really nice bedding, a great rug, cool side tables. Prices are lower in part because IKEA is basically a giant storage facility for furniture parts. It's the warehouse's design that sets it apart. So what a great store will do, will allow you the pleasure of discovery. So anytime I hear a retailer saying, our consumers want to come in, take some stuff and run out. Yes, they will if you didn't give them the pleasure of discovery. So a great store will give you the sense of comfort and familiarity and will also give you the pleasure of discovery. And that is when retail becomes retail therapy. The winding maze is designed to make customers stop and shop and spend more than they planned. You walk through an IKEA store and you find the number of mirrors. Mirrors place tastefully here, tastefully there, on a table, on a closet, etc. The brain is entranced with mirrors. Why? Why? When you look in a mirror, you see the most gorgeous human being looking back at you. IKEA plays to the narcissist in each of us. IKEA employs mirrors everywhere through their stores. As you walk by, you have love, 
because you have love for yourself in the mirror. Point number one. Point number two, IKEA uses white everywhere through the store. White cupboards, white closets, white tables. There is almost an Apple-esque view. If Apple was to design a closet, it would probably look like an IKEA closet. The brain perceives everything through context. The notion of that white there symbolizes clutter-free, pure, simple, transparent, without saying all those words to the judicious use of white that is spotless, IKEA communicates what you aspire for your home. The crisp, clean aesthetic lends itself to a broad audience. But IKEA doesn't just sell furniture. Glassware. I would always go to IKEA for glassware, dishes, pots and pans. I love their $500 solid wood bed. Depending on the situation, they have some very nice minimal sofas. I do not shop at Ikea for bedding. Pillows, duvets, comforters, sheets, and towels, I think are items that you really want to invest in. For families shopping at Ikea, some locations have complimentary daycare. With or without the kids, shopping can be exhausting. Do you know that the most tiring environment for the entire human brain, the most tiring environment, is a retail environment? It is the worst environment for the human brain, simply because you're processing so much information. But IKEA has a plan to keep you energized. When I hear IKEA, I think of meatballs. It recognizes that customers need sustenance to keep shopping. Right in the center of most stores, you'll find a cafeteria serving up Swedish fare. But in 2013, horse meat was detected in IKEA's meatballs. The problem was traced back to a European supplier and only affected European stores. IKEA pulled all meatballs until this issue was resolved. Despite this news going viral, the iconic dish remains on the menu. Another IKEA classic, the cinnamon bun. Its placement near the exit is no accident. It's a part of the brain that fires every time you pay, right? And so by having the scent of baking, of warmth, of sugar in particular, that takes the stress out, they get down the stress of payment. And therefore, the experience is memorable without it overwhelming you with how much money you spent out there. But whether you buy IKEA furniture in the store or online, once you open the boxes, it's time to get to work. The problem with IKEA was you realized that the, the closet was so minimalist and beautifully designed, but oh my God, there are 10 million parts I gotta put together to get the minimalistic design. What I don't like is that you have to put everything together by yourself. Like, I want a delivery. Deliver it to me and put it together. Like, what if you're a single mom? You don't have anybody to do that for you. However, according to a 2011 study by Harvard Business School, you are more inclined to value an item you built yourself. The study even named this phenomenon the IKEA effect. But many customers don't want to assemble their own furniture. One of the other really big trends we're seeing is a shift towards services. So you have people like Amazon that are offering convenience. Now all of a sudden, it's not just how good is the product in your store, it's what kind of simplicity can we offer our customers. The best a cabinet is the most versatile. It stands on legs, you can hang it on the wall, anything you need the best unit to do. I highly advise it. Hire TaskRabbit to put it together and hang it on the wall. It'll just make your life easier. So in 2017, IKEA acquired TaskRabbit. Now for a flat fee, IKEA customers can hire TaskRabbit to do the assembly. Since the acquisition, TaskRabbit's furniture assembly tasks have gone up from 2% to 10%. There's been a lot going on with IKEA lately. Since 2010, the company has recalled millions of products. The most infamous, the mom line of chests and dressers. IKEA is recalling 29 million dressers for a second time after the product was blamed for the death of an eighth child in May. Consumers are being asked to secure the items or return them. It still sells these items today. IKEA is currently making some necessary changes to its business model. 
one of the new things, if you like, um, is the investments in digital. Well, we have given ourselves three years to make a massive transformation. So if you want to do it at home on a Tuesday evening when the kids are to bed and things are done, we will try to bring our solutions and our knowledge uh, digitally to you. It's investing in its online presence, delivery services, and opening smaller stores. The majority of IKEA stores are operated by Inca Group. Its operating income, one measure of profits, was down 26% in 2018. Inca Group says the drop in profits is part of the plan. IKEA will close its only U.S. factory at the end of 2019. IKEA Group, the owner of most IKEA furniture stores worldwide, says it plans to cut 7,500 jobs over the next couple of years. Those cuts will be focused on administrative staff positions. At the same time, however, the group also says it will create 11,500 new positions as it expands with new store formats and online. IKEA thrives on a business of quantity, not quality. You can say that IKEA is the fast fashion of home furnishing because it does produce relatively inexpensive products that you know, may seem disposable because of the, say, average quality. You know, whether or not IKEA is sustainable because of that functionality of encouraging people to buy more. True sustainability would be people buying better quality things that last longer and that results in fewer purchases, but that is not how corporations work. It seems like customers don't work that way either. Depending on the country, people will say that they care about the climate, they care about sustainability, but if there's a higher price tag to that, it will deter some people. It's very easy to, do, to design a sofa for, uh, for $3,000. But to do a comfortable sofa with good quality that the kids can jump up and down in, with removable covers so you can wash them, that is made of sustainable foam that you can bring back in the supply chain and make a new sofa, and it's beautiful and comfortable at the low price, is very, very difficult. So our fascination is around that problem, not to make something expensive. IKEA alone used 18 million cubic meters of commercial wood in 2018. It's making a conscious effort towards sustainability. As of 2018, IKEA's Inca Group owns around 445,000 acres of responsibly managed forests. Inca Group has planted 3.6 million trees and had harvested 700,000 trees in 2018. The clock is ticking, so um, uh, it's time for companies like us to commit, uh, start working out our plans and live with that we might not have all the answers, but we will find them in the decade or so to come. While the company aims to make internal changes, it's also focusing on extending the life of products it's already sold. 90% or north of 90% of all our consumers are concerned today, or really concerned about climate, but only 3% know what they can do. So what we will try is to try different ways of supporting them with saving water, waste, energy, and to that, uh, testing and trying new ways of where you can also rent furniture or lease furniture from us. So we keep the, the furniture in the system a, a longer while. So that's just one of the different tests that we are doing right now. In the meantime, IKEA is opening planning studios in city centers. The showrooms are significantly smaller than traditional IKEA stores. What IKEA and a lot of other retailers are trying to do is downsize their footprint and focus on doing smaller stores that can cater to today's shoppers. The first IKEA planning studio opened in Manhattan in April 2019. Giants like Target and Dollar General are also opening smaller shops. And online companies like Wayfair are also adjusting their strategies. So one strength that IKEA has is the fact that it does have a brick and mortar footprint because people can pick it up and that's cheaper for them to operate. One of the things that Wayfair really struggles with is its cost of doing business. That's why we're actually seeing Wayfair go into brick and mortar. So you're kind of seeing online retailers trying to adapt to brick and mortar and brick and mortar like Ikea trying to adapt to online, but both have strengths the others want. Wayfair is just one of many retailers coming for Ikea. For now, Ikea is still on top, but can it stay there, or will the growing marketplace level the playing field?
You just have those random little things that you didn't really know you ever wanted and then you can't somehow live without. Today, we are going to Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's. The ginger snap cookies. The babka is unbelievable. Coconut rolls. Those are my favorite things I've ever had in my life. The little signs with the corny jokes on them. Is that crazy to say, like, it just has a better vibe? Yeah. People love Trader Joe's. They really do. Welcome to Trader Joe's where super friendly workers help you shop for things like kale gnocchi and vegan tikka masala. Trader Joe's calls itself your neighborhood grocery store, except it's grown way beyond your neighborhood to over 500 stores nationwide. The late founder, Joe Coulomb, opened the first location in Los Angeles County in 1967. He then sold Trader Joe's to grocery giant Aldi in 1979. The quirky grocery brand has amassed a cult following among health and value conscious shoppers. It's so addicting. Prices and quality put together is unmatched pretty much anywhere else. Experts estimate Trader Joe's outsells all of the competition when it comes to sales per square foot. The company brought in estimated total sales of $13.7 billion in 2019. I'm at Trader Joe's right now. The fan fervor around Trader Joe's has consumers begging for more, even starting petitions for new locations. There are none nearby, and I've begged and beseeched. There are even Instagram influencers dedicated to Trader Joe's products. In terms of overall customer satisfaction, Trader Joe's was the highest ranking national brand in Consumer Reports' 2019 ranking of grocery chains. Customers report high levels of satisfaction, despite the fact that Trader Joe's is not necessarily convenient or a one-stop shop. It has a limited selection of meat, produce, and toiletries, and there's no deli, self-checkout, online shopping, or delivery service. Sometimes I feel like they're missing key things that you need to like make dinner. I get it. I know I could get a larger and more affordable selection of my diet staples like meat and produce, somewhere else. In fact, I live right next door to another major grocery store. But twice a month, I travel 100 blocks to shop at Trader Joe's on 72nd and Broadway in New York City. I wait in massive lines at what's officially the busiest Trader Joe's in the United States. Then I carry two heavy bags up and down four flights of stairs between the subway and my apartment. Trader Joe's may not be the very best all around grocery store, but it's not trying to be. The company does certain things so well, it's built one of the most passionate fan bases in the grocery business. Here's how. The thing that's preposterous, right, is it's, it's the anti-grocery store. You know, I often say, imagine that I was pitching to investors the concept of a new grocery store. And I said, we're gonna have virtually no branded goods. Nothing's ever gonna be on sale. There's no coupons. There's no loyalty card, no self-checkout. We're gonna have cramped aisles and small stores with limited selection, no TV ads. Would you invest? And people, of course, go, you know, no, that sounds crazy. Trader Joe's doesn't draw customers in with wide, shiny aisles or high-tech shopping. The company does minimal marketing and didn't have a social media presence until just a few years ago. Trader Joe's presents itself as a quaint local store. Everything is hand-drawn, handwritten, and that gives the store a very kind of low-key personal feeling. It also gives a feeling that you're kind of in a market or a local store that is not overly commercial. Trader Joe's has, I think, really captured the cultural zeitgeist in a way, as far as not only tapping into the foodie culture, but then also kind of the movement away from traditional and established national or global brands and overly processed or, or produced food. The neighborhood market atmosphere helps shoppers feel that they're making healthy and environmentally friendly choices. In terms of sustainability, people have this um, warm, fuzzy feeling, and it's kind of reflected in the packaging. Mark Gardner is a former marketing executive who became intrigued by the Trader Joe's brand. So he worked as a crew member, stocking shelves and ringing up customers at a Kansas City, Missouri location for a year, starting in 2011. Then he wrote a book about it called Build a Brand Like Trader Joe's. Gardner says Trader Joe's might look like a local store, but its environmental impact is not necessarily better than other grocery chains. When I worked there, we had a product that was non-bread. And the non-bread 
was baked and frozen in India and shipped frozen to Trader Joe's stores. That's pretty crazy. You can bake non-bread anywhere. Trader Joe's has made efforts to be more environmentally friendly, sometimes when under public pressure. Trader Joe's may not operate just like a local market, but the experience of being at one helps us feel good about our shopping decisions. The unique products that are only available at Trader Joe's. Kazoog sauce. I haven't seen that anywhere else except Trader Joe's. Teeny tiny uh, avocados. I feel like nobody else has those little avocados. Trader Joe's presents itself as a local store, but one with worldly connections. Founder Joe Coulomb gave the store a South Seas theme, complete with Hawaiian shirt-clad employees who are called captains and crew members. The theme plays upon the idea of merchants sailing the oceans to bring home diverse foods from around the world. Trader Joe's product developers travel the world seeking inspiration for these recipes. They discuss trips to New Zealand, Japan, the Republic of Georgia, and beyond in an episode of the official company podcast. They present their products as if they are local discoveries, something that someone found when they were, let's say, traveling Italy and they're now bringing it to you. The result? Trader Joe's products feel specially sourced, truly unique, and like they can't be found at other grocery stores. The products seem even more one of a kind due to a generous use of descriptive adjectives. They don't just have cheddar cheese, they have Wisconsin farmhouse cheddar cheese, or, you know, their gummy bears aren't just gummy bears, they are fish-shaped and so they're called Scandinavian swimmers. Customers want to feel like they are smart shoppers. If you can make them feel like they are in the know or that they have found something that other people haven't, then that really increases the value perception that they get from the price. When an exotic new product comes out, you might get your hands on it or you might not. What makes Trader Joe's products seem even more special is they come and go. Trader Joe's regularly introduces new products and then discontinues others, since the stores are relatively small and shelf space is limited. So there's also this issue of scarcity. If I like the item, buy it now, I'm not sure it'll be here next month. There is an element of impulse shopping that's going on, right, because of the treasure hunt. There's a sense of discovery, of things that feel rare and urgent. Sometimes when I come home from Trader Joe's, I find myself telling my husband everything I bought. And your favorite lava cake. It's almost like I'm bragging to him. Like, look what I found. And the process of making those discoveries is fun, too, because it's not too overwhelming. Trader Joe's stores are typically 10,000 to 15,000 square feet in size. The average grocery store is about 40,000 square feet, while supercenters like Walmart or Costco can exceed 200,000 square feet. Trader Joe's stores carry about 4,000 SKUs, or scannable units of inventory. The average grocery store carries about 30,000 SKUs, while supercenters can hold four times that. Researchers say too many choices can lead to paralysis. It's easier to decide what you want when choosing from a smaller selection of items, like at Trader Joe's. What customers really want is they want the perception of choice, but they want the experience of no conflict, of less choice. They want an easy choosing experience. Sheena Iyengar conducted a well-known experiment that studied just that. In the study, Iyengar set up a jam sampling station at a grocery store. She found that more people purchased jam when there were less options to choose from. Customers also feel more confident that, you know, I, I chose the best of what was here. So the entire experience makes them feel both more competent as well as more confident. What Trader Joe's doesn't want you to know is that you can find very similar or identical products at other grocery stores. The company sells more than 80% private label goods, meaning they're made by third-party manufacturers and sold with Trader Joe's branding. And Trader Joe's is notoriously secretive, especially about who their suppliers are. That way, you don't know where their products really come from. They don't want customers to feel that they have an alternative way to get the same thing. But in some cases, they actually could. Trader Joe's sources some of its products from major manufacturers that make all kinds of familiar goods. And some of those goods, under different brand names, may actually be similar or identical to the private label version sold at Trader Joe's. 
For example, a 2017 Eater investigation found that Naked Juice, a subsidiary of PepsiCo, has provided Trader Joe's with bottled smoothies. And when you compare a couple of Trader Joe's smoothies with their Naked Juice counterparts, the ingredients are nearly identical. But Trader Joe's can also have exclusive supplier relationships. I know when I worked there, there was a frozen pizza from Italy, and it was a little family in Italy somewhere that, that made the pizzas, and Trader Joe's was their only customer. Now that is obviously not the case for most products. Now Trader Joe's does prefer, if possible, to tweak the recipe so that technically they can say, okay, look, this is completely unique to us. The media expected there to be some backlash towards this idea that Trader Joe's was trying to pretend as if these products were their own. But I think that what consumers discovered is, you know what, I'm going to get the same product at a lower price in a better shopping environment at Trader Joe's. After all, one of the grocery store's biggest draws... The prices are amazing. Joe Coulomb established Trader Joe's in the 60s with a certain customer in mind. Coulomb said he created Trader Joe's to cater to the increasing numbers of people getting a college degree. It's the person who kind of has good taste, perhaps, who, who likes to try new things, but doesn't necessarily want to spend a great deal of money. So how does Trader Joe's keep prices down? By keeping its costs down. For one thing, Trader Joe's sells mostly private label goods, which are cheaper than name brand goods like Haagen-Dazs ice cream or Starbucks coffee. Experts say Trader Joe's is also able to negotiate better pricing from suppliers by purchasing goods in larger quantities. After all, Trader Joe's offers a smaller selection of products than traditional grocery stores, and thus sells larger quantities of each item. It's also possible that Trader Joe's has help from corporate parent Aldi. Aldi could leverage its relationships with suppliers to help Trader Joe's get better pricing. Despite all these cost-saving measures, experts say Trader Joe's isn't necessarily cheaper than other discount grocery stores. It just feels especially cheap. I'm not sure if it's so much the reality of a big price difference as it is the perception that you're getting a better value from Trader Joe's. You're getting higher quality ingredients, you're getting a better edited selection, you're getting a much more pleasant shopping experience. In other words, you're getting more for your money than at similarly priced rivals. But the Trader Joe's shopping experience isn't just about feeling that the products are a great value. It's about feeling that you are valued. At this particular location, there's several people that, um, that know me by name and, you know, hey, how you doing? Why are Trader Joe's workers so friendly and happy all the time? They're always striking up conversation with you at the cash register or when walking you to a product you're looking for. When Mark Gardner worked at Trader Joe's, he found that this employee behavior is not an accident. They barely showed me how to work the cash register, but they spent hours and hours acting out, little play acting exercises of how you would interact with a customer. By observing his peers, Gardner realized Trader Joe's prefers to hire a certain kind of person. People who are naturally extroverted, naturally empathetic. And Trader Joe's is willing to pay above industry standard for those employees. According to the Trader Joe's podcast, crew members get raises twice a year. Perks can also include health insurance and retirement benefits. Gardner enjoyed working at Trader Joe's, but the job wasn't without its headaches. Scheduling of staff was a complete disaster. It was the most completely crazily disorganized. So there were a lot of things that they're not good at. Really basic grocery store stuff like restocking the store. Are they ordering the right mix of stuff? Are they ordering the stuff that people actually want? They're not that good at that. Are they keeping cold things cold? Are they keeping frozen things frozen? They're not that good at that. They're not particularly good at being a grocery store. They're really not. What they're good at is this one thing, building this incredible brand. But experts say Trader Joe's isn't trying to be the very best grocery store. Trader Joe's is acknowledging that for most Americans, you can't do all your shopping at Trader Joe's, right? You've still got to go to another grocery store. I do think sometimes you need the basics and they don't have it. Sometimes the produce may not be like as fresh as other places. The company's meat and produce sections have drawn criticism in the past for being limited or not the best quality. They've realized, hey, we can't be all things to all people. 
and we know that our customers will also shop the competition, but what will they shop us for? And can we be best in class for those products? Let's be honest, grocery shopping can be a chore. It's an errand many are happy to outsource to Amazon or Instacart. Technology is trending toward eliminating the grocery store shopping experience altogether. Meanwhile, Trader Joe's isn't competing on convenience. It's giving you a different kind of grocery shopping experience, one that motivates people to seriously inconvenience themselves in order to shop there. The company has successful regional competition from the likes of Wegmans on the East Coast and HEB in the South. But other national and multinational grocery brands have tried and failed to imitate the concept in the U.S. Roberto says Trader Joe's is hard to copy because it doesn't have just one competitive advantage. The goal for any company, right, isn't just to build a distinctive strategy, it's, it's to build a moat around their castle, to be able to defend the castle. How do you do that? You build a unique system of activities, of interlocking choices and activities, right? A system where things fit together really well. That's how Trader Joe's has carved out its own niche in a very cutthroat industry. You can go anywhere to tick off a checklist of basic needs. But at Trader Joe's, it's about the joy of discovering something unexpected, even if it means not checking off a few things on your list.